welcome everyone. My name is Janine Wendt. I'm the executive director of HECMA, which stands for the Higher Education Consortium of Central Massachusetts. Here with me are panelists who are responsible for graduate admissions at their institutions. And they're here to talk to you first about general grad admissions and financial aid issues. And then there will be an opportunity at the end to go into breakout rooms. You've been pre-assigned based on your interest to go into the first breakout room, ask any questions you have for the institution of interest. And then there is a way for you to move about from breakout room to breakout room based on other interests that you have so that you can try to get all of your questions answered today. The format that we're starting with, you'll get to hear first from each of the panelists about their, uh, their institution. And then Paul Vaccaro from Anna Maria College will be facilitating a discussion and posing questions to each of the panelists. There will be a little bit of time at the end of the hour to take some questions, general questions from you. And then we will be popping into the breakout rooms. And like I said, you can go from room to room. If you have problems getting from one room to the next, feel free to come back to the main room and uh, my colleague Lisa or I will help you get to that next room of choice. All right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you first to Anna Maria College's own Paul Vaccaro, who will be our master of ceremonies today. Thank you, Janine. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, just to give you a, a quick overview of uh, Anna Maria College, um, we are located in Paxton, Mass., uh, just uh, outside of the Worcester area. And at the master's level, uh, Anna Maria focuses on providing graduate education for the health and service professions uh, with programs related to the protective well being, the educational well being, uh, the mental well being, the human health well being, and spiritual well being of others. And this includes an MBA program with both a general and health administration focus, as well as master's degrees in criminal justice, education, counseling psychology, industrial organizational psychology, social work, health emergency management, and pastoral ministry. Uh, we are a small college and embrace being such and the benefits that it can have for graduate students, most notably in providing a very highly personalized education that they can receive where faculty get to know them and take a great interest in you, your careers and directions. and I will turn it over to Assumption College. Thanks, Paul. Um, my name is Susan Cahill. I'm the Assistant Director of Graduate Admissions here at Assumption University, newly university since last uh, June, so that's very exciting for us. We're located in Worcester, Massachusetts, a nice residential area there off Salisbury Street. We have 12 graduate programs, many of those programs in the helping professions. Um, I'll just name a few of those. We have a clinical counseling psychology, applied behavior analysis. We have rehabilitation counseling, school counseling and special education. And uh, we also have an MBA program with many avenues to explore there. We have about 400 graduate students. So we too are very much on the small side of things, offering small class sizes. I've been a very much of a small town feel environment. And lastly, we have flexible learning formats. So we offer a variety of our programs online as well as on campus. And let's see who would be next. Uh, Clark. Going Clark. Clark. <laughs> Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor Bethel. I'm the Assistant Director for Domestic Recruitment for Clark University's graduate programs. So Clark is located in the heart of the Maine South neighborhood in Worcester. We offer 32 advanced degrees and 13 certificate programs across our three schools, the School of Management, School of Professional Studies, and our International Development and Environment and Community School. So Clark students are really known for their passion for world issues and desire to be change makers in their field. Um, our faculty are great. They really take care to maintain a collaborative learning environment um, and many opportunities for students. We're also quite small, so you're really going to get to know the faculty and your peers. Next, the Coming School of Veterinary Medicine. I know if we'd be coming school or tough, so I think I'd wait for my cue. Um, so my name is Ford Barnett. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions at Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. And so we are on uh, the North Grafton campus of Tufts and that campus is specific vet specifically veterinary related. So 
We offer a DVM program. We offer three standalone master's programs and a PhD opportunity. Um, and some of the other panelists have mentioned they're small schools. So that is what to expect within our program as well. Um, in that by being so niche and, and a veterinary campus, we have about 450 students on campus. Uh, about 400 are part of our DVM program, which is a four-year doctorate. So 100 per class and the other 50 make up uh, master students. Next is MCPHS University. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick Cameron. I am the Associate Director of Admission here at MCPHS. Uh, I am in our Worcester campus, but I also represent our Manchester, New Hampshire and various online programs. Uh, most notably in our Worcester campus, we offer our Doctorate of Pharmacy, Masters of Physician Assistant Studies, as well as Doctor of Optometry, um, as well as other several post-baccalaureate transfer programs and other uh, terminal and uh, terminal doctoral and master's level programs. We're located in the downtown heart of the city of Worcester. Um, and we are a smaller campus here in the city, uh, roughly right around 2000 students uh, across all of our various programs uh, that we offer in Worcester. UMass Medical School. Hi, I am Jen with the School of Medicine for the UMass Medical School, but we do um, maintain three schools as part of UMass Medical School. The School of Medicine, where we have our MD, MD, PhD, and MD, MBA programs. Then we also have our Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, where you can get your PhD in a number of biomedical science fields from cell biology to molecular biology and the like. And we have a Graduate School of Nursing as well with a number of programs there too. So I'm happy to speak to you about them. WPI. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Amy. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions um, for Graduate Admissions at WPI. Um, we are located just it's a, you still consider us downtown Worcester. Um, we have about over 50 different graduate programs. Um, we have about 800 graduate students um, on campus, plus a large amount that are online. Um, most of our programs are offered kind of in a flexible format. So most of them are offered as an on-campus format or online, depending on kind of what you're looking for. Um, I think COVID in the past year kind of helped make that push. Um, so there are a lot more options online than there were before. Um, WPI, when you think of WPI, should you think about STEM? Um, so we are originally an engineering school founded in 1865. So we've been around for quite a while um, and mainly balancing that theory and practice mode um, is what you're going to find at WPI. Um, and we also have a school of business. So we have science and engineering programs and we also have six different um, management programs within WPI. What's your say? Hi everyone, thanks for hanging in there. I know it's been a long list. And thank you for those of you who have your cameras on. It's, it's so helpful to see faces. My name is Sarah Grady. I'm the Associate Dean of Graduate uh, Studies at Worcester State. We have about 30 programs. About half of those programs are in various fields of education. The other half make up uh, sciences, uh, speech language, occupational therapy, nursing, biotechnology. We also have management programs, either nonprofit, public, uh, for-profit. And then we also have a Master of Arts in English, History, and Spanish. Um, I am happy to speak to you about any of those programs. Thank you for coming. And thank you to all of our schools for uh, being represented today. Um, and again, on behalf of all of our schools, we welcome uh, you to this session. Um, if you were to go on uh, the website gradschools.com, you would currently find listings for over 70,000 graduate programs in this directory with over 2,400 colleges and universities uh, in the US alone offering graduate degree programs. So the choices available to you are many. And part of our job tonight is to begin to help you navigate through the search process where that number ultimately gets narrowed down to one program in one school. You have just heard brief intros from the eight institutions in the Central Mass area, uh, but in many ways our institutions collectively represent a bulk of the graduate schools out there that are available to you in terms of our varying student sizes, the types of campus we feature, 
and our areas of study from very specialized degrees to more traditional graduate programs. And as part of our schedule tonight, um, as uh, Janine alluded to, we will first address some frequently asked questions as it relates to expectations, uh, the admissions process, financial aid, and general tips towards selecting the right school for you. Uh, from a panel of experts that I would venture to guess has close to about 100 years of total experience uh, in college admissions and higher education. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's get started, uh, where we're going to rotate responses amongst our school representatives uh, with three schools charged with answering each question. And our first question will be directed to my colleagues at Worcester State, WPI, and Tufts. And that question is, what do you see as being the biggest difference between undergraduate and graduate study? We'll start Thank with Worcester you. State. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I would say the biggest difference is no gen eds, right? You don't have to take those like random classes that you may or may not have an interest in. You just get to study what it is you want to study. And I, and I really do love that about graduate school. Um, certainly more independent work is expected uh, with grad versus undergrad work. Um, for the most part, generally speaking, you have fewer assignments and they're worth more, they're larger assignments. Uh, you're expected to do a lot more independent work on those assignments. And also the, the question becomes not, undergrad is about sharing and conveying information to you, right? Graduate school, you, you are asked to contribute to the field. So many of your large papers, capstone projects, they might be publishable. You know, that, that, that's not the goal of every assignment, but some of them, uh, it, you're not just learning from experts, you're becoming an expert. And I think that's a very different uh, mindset. Well, Sarah, it's kind of hard to go after you because as you're speaking, I'm like, yeah, that's what I was going to say too. Um, I think really in grad school, you're right. You are becoming the expert. And you know, it's not just it's not just your faculty member that could be the expert in the room now. Your colleagues could also help be the expert in the room. So, you know, depending on what program you're going into, you could be going in directly out of undergrad. You could be going into a program that maybe there are seasoned professionals within that graduate program. So you really could be also learning from each other um, as well as you're learning from your faculty member and your mentors. Um, I would also like to say that sometimes it's gonna be different because you could be taking classes at night versus you know, your traditional undergrad day classes. Um, and again, it's, no, you know, it's not your general core anymore. It's really getting into whatever that subject matter is that you're studying. Um, it's not worrying about, oh crap, you know, I, gotta, I gotta get those social science credits in when I'm a robotics major you know, as undergrad. And it's really gonna be different on the grad level. So I'd also like to say you have a little bit more freedom in what you wanna dive into in a grad program. Um, and sometimes you could be, you're going to be held at a little bit of a higher level. There's going to be more expectation on the graduate level than say the undergrad when you were kind of getting used to being in school. Um, that expectation is already going to be there um, when you get to grad school. So build off of what those two panelists just said with there being, it being far more specialized and fewer gen ed and all that other stuff. What it also means is that you as a student need to be more informed. Um, you need to it's not like going to college for the sake of going to college because some people do that. That was my situation. I went to college because I was expected I'd go to college and I'd figure out what my major was and I'll, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. Going to grad school needs to be a very informed decision. You need to kind of have an idea of, you may not know exactly what you're going to do within that area, but you need to be informed as far as what are some challenges there? What can I expect? What kind of contribution do I need to make? Should I be going into you could be really interested in medicine, for example, and go into vet medicine, human medicine, dental, you could be a PhD, and you can still make contributions in a variety of different science areas. So the other thing is to just kind of have conversations ahead of time and don't plan on figuring it out entirely while you're there. I think that's a very big difference in, in undergrad and graduate school, um, especially because depending on the program, some of these programs are fairly short um where you need to get the most out of a one-year or two-year program that it's very it's very beneficial to you to have already explored what you're interested in and some areas that you're not interested in so that you know when amy's talking about different opportunities for exploration within their programs you don't want to just be floating out there you want to say at least have some direction as to what you want to take advantage of thank you folks 
Um, our second question uh, will be directed to the Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, UMass Medical, and Anna Maria. Um, we, uh, COVID was, uh, re uh, was uh, mentioned amongst our introductions, and obviously, unfortunately, it seems like we can't finish a sentence without um, COVID being involved. Um, so with that said, how has COVID changed graduate education? We'll start with the Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Sure. Um, well, first and foremost, it, it changed how we as an institution, um, as and I'm sure with a lot of the other panelists here, uh, look at education and how it's delivered in regards to some of the different modalities. Alongside um, with, with us here at MCPHS, the bulk of our programs have some type of lab component uh, along with a clinical component. And there were many students who were off in some clinical experiences um, when COVID first hit. And uh, we've had to, you know, send students out um, in other type of settings, whether they be nurses, pharmacists, PAs, so on and so forth. So um, it's really changed how we look at delivering information in regards to uh, the lecture via Zoom. Um, but uh, in regards to what we have done as an institution, nothing has really changed. You know, our students are still getting that uh, top quality um, experience and that uh, really one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, uh, relationship with faculties that a lot of healthcare providers need in order to become strong clinicians. So that's something that has never really left our education. It's just we've had to figure out some different ways in order to make sure our students are still getting all of the attention and care that they ultimately need. You mess? Back a little bit on that in the sense that our, our processes changed, yes, because of the state's emergency order, but for the most part at the medical school, our students have been engaged in a hybrid learning model the entire time. So what I think is more important to look at and what has changed in graduate education is potentially how you apply, what requirements are, what expectations are from admissions offices. For example, our schools taking pass-fail credit, how did that manage? Are you able to get the experiences you had hoped to have during the pandemic that got canceled? And how have you been able to work through that experience and how has that changed? So look at it almost too from the lens of how has the world changed and how has that impacted your original goals? And do you still have them? And how can you make sure you're filling out an application that says I'm strong for graduate programs and I've hit and explored these unique areas even though this major global pandemic has impacted not only me and my desires, but everyone else too, how do I use that to my advantage to stand out? So don't worry too much about how the school has pivoted because we've all had to make those changes and we're all still learning what ones are best to keep and what ones are going to definitely return to our old normal, but think more about the application side as you prepare and what you're looking for and how to put your best foot forward. And I'll add to that that I think it uh, it did force schools to build flexibility into their programming by introducing remote learning as a delivery method. Um, you know, a, a school like Anna Maria, we, we had already prided ourselves on the flexibility and convenience into, into our scheduling, whether it be through evening classes, you know, the opportunity to take two classes in the same night, accelerated courses, uh, online classes and uh, hybrid classes, but the addition of remote uh, learning um, allowed us to really extend um, the classroom as it did all of our uh, institutions here uh, and building that flexibility and convenience and taking it really to the next level, um, really to the point where um, when we do hopefully get back to you know, some sense of normalcy, um, we're very seriously considering keeping the remote aspect in as an option uh, for students moving forward. Um, one thing I think is important as a, uh, a future or prospective graduate student is to have an understanding of what uh, colleges mean by uh, offering on-ground, online, remote, and hybrid classes, uh, as well as uh, the word synchronous and asynchronous learning. Um, synchronous learning, uh, you'll find out, is basically real-time. So real-time can be on-ground, real-time can be remote. Um, uh, versus asynchronous learning, asynchronous learning is your, uh, your online classes that are taken basically at, a, at a, any time that you want and you desire within a certain time frame. 
Um, and a hybrid basically combines an aspect of online uh, plus the synchronous learning at that point. So just, um, and, and schools may have different definitions of those. Um, so I think it's very important that as you're looking at schools, um, you get the definition of what a true remote class means and what you know, a true online class means uh, with that. So good, good questions to ask as you move forward. So. All right, our third question um, will be answered by WPI Assumption and Clark. Um, and that is, how does applying to graduate school differ from applying to undergraduate school? So now we're beginning to get into the admissions process now. WPI. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Um, I will say one thing is follow directions. Um, grad school applications can be a, li a little bit more daunting than undergrad because now, granted, depending on what field you're going into, the Common App doesn't really exist anymore when we're talking about grad school. Um, you may find certain professions such as Pat could, you know, from MCPHS could talk about, you know, if you're applying to pharmacy school, technically you, you could use one application and apply to, to 10 different schools. Um, that's going to be different depending on what kind of industry you're going into. So that's not always going to be the case. There are some options there. So really to make sure that you're looking at the school's website, what school requires what, and really what program requires what. Um, it's not, you're going to get into some very specific disciplines that may be requiring some very specific criteria to come in, whether that's prerequisite courses, whether that could be um, project experience, they could be looking for um, certain, um, I don't know, certain different statements of purpose and things that you wouldn't think that a school would ask you, but maybe they are. So kind of checking into all of those fine details is one thing that could be kind of, um, I don't know, could take you a long time, really time consuming with grad applications. But um, once you know kind of what you're looking for and kind of that niche subject, it really should kind of all come together. Um, FAFSA is still a thing, keep that in mind. Um, I think we may go into a little bit more detail on that when we talk about financial aid. Um, and to really pay attention to those application deadlines. Um, grad school, especially if you're applying to medical school versus maybe some more general programs, they could be running on different application cycles and kind of what you're used to when you were applying to undergrad. Everything kind of had a lot of the same different deadline dates. Um, when you get to grad school, that's gonna be a little different as well. Assumption? Definitely agree with what Amy was saying. That was a couple of my notes here. Deadlines, you know, each we have 12 different programs. We have different program directors that review each application. So it's going to be different depending on the start term and, and you know, when you're starting the program, what semester you're coming into. So deadlines are really important. Um, we do not require the GMAT or GRE at Assumption University. So that's something that we do not require. We, we look at applications a little bit more holistically. So we're going to pay attention, really close attention to your personal statement your letters of recommendation. You want to make sure that those application documents are strong, well-written, proofread, all of that. Um, we So our application is actually very, relatively simple at Assumption. Uh, it's, it's listed on the top of our website on every page, and it's uh, relatively simple to get through. It's not lengthy. You're just kind of entering your education and your details um, and your, you know, just your, your professional background on that. And it's all electronic, too, so it's actually really easy to get things uploaded onto it, and you'll be taken to a checklist that we have where you'll be able to see its progress. So you'll be able to kind of keep tabs on that and see where you, where you stand um, as far as completion and, and how many um, of the different pieces that have arrived. Um, and each of our applications are reviewed via a program committee. So they're not reviewed by like myself or an admissions counselor. Um, so that's important to know. And um, again, I just can't emphasize enough your letters of recommendation and your personal statement being strong and well-written. And Clark. Yeah. <clears throat> I would definitely agree with all of that. Um, obviously, as you're applying to graduate school, you now have give or take four more years under your belt. So that means you're going to be bringing work experience, volunteer experience, internship experience, um, research experience. So there's a lot more than just looking at your GPA and academics. And I think that the majority of departments, especially at Clark, are really looking for a holistically strong candidate considering all things. So it's easy to get caught up on just the academic side, what your major is, what your GPA is. And obviously for some programs, it's going to be really specific. And as they were saying, you do need to make sure that you know the requirements for each program and then lean into those requirements per your major so or per your program. So for the MBA, for example, it might require GRE and that's going to be really where you're focusing. But then you might apply to international development and it's really important that you have a really strong letter of recommendation and statement. 
So just really pay attention to what is expected for each program. Thank you, everyone. Our next question will be answered by Tufts, Worcester State, and UMass Medical, and that is, what should candidates be doing now as part of the graduate search process? We'll start with Tufts. So once you've decided what your goal is, um, people are going to decide what schools they apply to and what school they ultimately choose based on cost, location, and what that program offers. How you rank those is also gonna determine um, where you end up going. So for example, there are a lot of people that get into our program and um, we're their top choice and they may not come here if, so, if they're going to prioritize location and having a support system by them or if they have a less expensive option or some people will choose us over um, other schools for those same reasons. So I think that one of the first things that you should start doing once you decide what your goal is, is figure out what's important to you. How would you rank those um, factors? Start making a, a little book then once you come up with maybe your like top five, eight schools, and then start thinking about what prerequisites do they need? Are there minimum hours of criteria for this or that? And just stay on top of things because as they, they said in the last question, Deadlines are different, prerequisites are different, um, and you just don't want something to, to pass you by. Worcester State. Thank you. So I, I don't think we can emphasize enough that at, in graduate school, I'm sorry about the telephone, <laughs> um, at, at graduate school, uh, you really are looking at programs, not the university overall. So within each university, programs are going to run very differently. So you might have a very competitive program at one school and then the same pro or a similar program at the same school is less competitive. Deadlines are going to be different. Processes are going to be different. Uh, requirements are going to be different. So if a friend of yours says I had to do XYZ at this school, don't, if you're applying to a different program, don't assume it's going to be the same. So really want to emphasize that you're looking at programs, not necessarily schools. Um, you need to know the prerequisites because you can make choices now in the courses that you choose in your undergraduate program that are going to help you get into that graduate program. So no prerequisites, know what standardized tests are required, if any, because you need to start studying for those and you need to book those out weeks in advance. Uh, and then of, and of course the deadlines, the deadlines vary greatly. Sometimes it's a one start per year, other times it's three different starts per year and it's a rolling admissions process. So um, again, it's, it's looking at individual programs, knowing prerequisites and test scores, and also understanding each individual program's deadlines. I couldn't agree more with what both of you just said. I am going to take it a little bit more literally as in the now being today is April 13th. So when you look at a biomedical sciences or medical school, this is actually a really perfect time for medical school. The AMCAS application will open the end of this month so you can start preparing, entering questions and so knowing what you're looking for for schools, you know, starting to explore ways in which you want to talk about personal statements what data you need, getting all of your ducks in a row and prepared to start doing that when that application opens. Because for medical programs, the earlier you can apply, the better it is in the sense that it takes time. You're going through an application system with AMCAS first, and then you're going off to your schools that you're actually having individual deadlines for. So that earlier for that first primary application is going to be beneficial to you. When you look at a nursing or a PhD program, it's also important to see, you know, where are the researchers and the research that you're interested in working? What schools are they at? What programs are they a part of? Can you explore those programs a little bit more in depthly and have conversations now? So when their applications do open, you've not only set yourself up for success by knowing that this school has this researcher, this field that you're really interested in, You've been doing the work on your own and two to prepare for that and incorporate your interests and ally them with the institution and that program when you're looking in that direction. So I definitely see that as a benefit to utilize the time where we are right now in early April to prepare yourself, but also start doing some of the homework that helps you get ready for those later application start times that might be in June or July or even a little bit later in the summer. So prepare that way. 
But as everyone said before, deadlines are the big piece. So be mindful of them. Know if there are multiple deadlines and how that works and be um, as early as you can be, but make sure you're submitting strong prepared work as well. Great responses, thank you. <clears throat> well, can me. I add one thing just real quickly? Please, yes. Um, Because I take notes and then I just wing it and then I'm like, oh, I forgot to say that. I think one thing that's also helpful is just to um, quickly look up how many in-state students are they taking? How many out-of-state students? How they, you know, once you come up with your list, also start strategizing. Um, and that's something I help students with every day is, you know, how many schools should they be applying to and why and where are their prereqs and their experiences and their, where are they going to stand out? So I think that's helpful too, is not only to be on top of that, but also to just kind of get an idea of what's realistic and, and what makes sense to apply to, given that you're not going to apply to the however many tens of thousands of programs you mentioned. Um, so which ones are the right ones for you? And I think that perfectly feeds into our next question, um, which will be answered by Anna Maria, Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences and Assumption. And that is how do schools evaluate graduate candidates and what do they require as part of the application process? And I guess I'll, I'll start with this one. And uh, you've heard the word holistic uh, mentioned more than a few times already. And um, certainly that is the case at Anna Maria and I think at many of our institutions and um, essentially with it by a holistic um, nature of admissions, we're really looking at the total application. Um, one of the things that we have to make a decision on um, is really attempting to answer the question of whether or not a student has the potential and motivation to be successful in, the, in a graduate classroom. And um, so certainly, um, you know, all schools are requiring transcripts, your, your resume, your statement of purpose, your letters of recommendation. Um, test scores can be a, you know, a little bit hit or miss right now. Um, some, uh, I know uh, Assumption mentioned that they are test optional. Anna Maria uh, is the same in being test optional. Um, some schools have um, um, kind of suspended it during COVID. Um, other schools still require it. So again, something that you want to uh, look at and, and see what their uh, ranges are in terms of what they accept uh, in, in terms of what their scores are. Um, at the same time, you know, obviously uh, on your transcript, your academic performance at the undergraduate level um, is, is certainly a driver uh, towards admission, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily the be all and end all either. And certainly, um, you know, the work experience that you can bring into a classroom is critical to that. And ultimately, this college or university determining if there's a fit uh, with you. And that, that addresses specifically um, how work recommenders are, are, uh, are describing you and how you're describing yourself in terms of your personal statement. And so I think it's been mentioned how important that personal statement in is. And um, certainly I would uh, concur with that in terms of uh, seeking if there's a, a match between us to the school and the individual. So. Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Sure. Um, and I, I think, I, I believe it was Sarah who was talking about this, where uh, looking at uh, some of the requirements of some programs and some programs being a little bit more competitive than some other ones that are offered at the same institution. Um, and that's extremely important. And, and this was uh, kind of been an overall theme here of the panel of doing your homework and doing your research on uh, expectations, requirements, and uh, knowing the difference between minimum averages or, or minimum requirements for a application, as well as competitive requirements for an application. For example, our physician assistant program is by far our most competitive program here on our Worcester campus. Um, the minimum GPA that we require is a 3-2, but typically competitive applicants are much higher than that in the three, five, three, six, and three, seven range. And, you know, folks who are down towards the three, five range often have, uh, you know, thousands of hours of direct patient care experience. Um, I'll also say uh, a number of our programs here on campus also require an interview. Um, I primarily work with our doctor of optometry students and, um, you know, there's there's a ton of students we bring in, not a ton of students, but there's some students we bring in for interview um, and we read their application and, and we're like, wow, these are some wonderful candidates. We can't wait to meet them. And then 
they sit down for their interview and they don't know the difference between a uh, optician, optometrist, or ophthalmologist. And those are all very different um, professions. And, um, yeah, you know, something I say in a lot of the presentations I do, it's extremely important to, again, do your research, but, um, you know, prepare for interviews as well, as that's a key component for us, that we have students we think are slam dunks and, you know, oh, they're shoo-ins, they're going to be accepts, no doubt, and then they come in for their interview and we're like, did you have a ghostwriter? You know, who was, who was the person who wrote your application? So, um, you know, make sure you, you, you prepare properly uh, is probably the thing that I can um, say the most because, all of that really, really matters um, for a lot of the admission offices here. Assumption? And, um, thank you, Patrick. That's a really good point. I know when our directors or our com committees are looking at an application and they might be on the fence about somebody, the interview is really important to showcase yourself. Um, we The interview and also the personal statement are two pieces of um, two places where you can really indicate your interest in the program and your understanding of the program. I've received personal statements that I've looked at where somebody's applying to some program and they don't have a clear understanding of what it is. So I think that's a really important piece. Um, not only is it well written, but that you have a clear understanding of what you're applying to to make sure it's a good fit for both of us, for the student and the university or college. Um, with me again, yes, holistic. We review things holistically. Our minimum GPA is typically a 3.0, but I always let students know if they're at a 2.7, you know, still apply. We will look at all of your application documents, materials, all of that. And again, if we're on the fence with somebody, they will call in and, and some of our programs will call in an interview, um, even if they don't typically do that. So we look at things holistically and take all the pieces into consideration. So they're all kind of equally as important. And just something back on the application deadline, I just wanted to mention there's a lot of confusion at times of what does that mean for the application deadline with us it's a completed application it's not just applying but it's having all of your documents and materials in so that's something really important to keep in mind we need a completed application by that application uh, deadline well you've heard the word statement of purpose and letters of recommendation uh, a number of times uh, throughout so far and um, so that, let's uh, talk a little bit about that just in terms of um, the, the value in the admissions process to, of them and what are schools specifically looking for uh, in both the statement of purpose and the letters of recommendation that students um, need to be aware of uh, and we will have uh, we hear from UMass Medical, uh, Clark and WPI on this. UMass. So I think uh, this is a big part of one's application because there are so many factors that can go into it and there are usually multiple places. So with a medical school for your MD, MD, PhD degree, you're gonna have your general personal statement, but then you're also gonna have the supplemental or secondary applications that have additional short answer questions for each of the schools that you apply to. So it's important to not just only be mindful of the story you're telling of who you are and why this is important to you, but that you're also working in um, the school's questions and their specific nature to each of those questions. You don't want to be just kind of control F finding a school's name and replacing it with someone else's. You want to make sure that you're actually finding the connections and tying through and answering their specific questions, which is often a little bit more uh, nuanced than your personal statement. That personal statement tends to be broader, encompasses a lot of things, and so you want to be mindful that there's going to be both of those opportunities on many graduate school applications and that they are serving different purposes. So don't just regurgitate the same or think you can do the same for each school over and over. Um, when it comes to your letters of recommendation, they're equally important. Going back to you know, our needs as a medical school, we're gonna be looking for people who can speak to your science, understanding your science background. Did you have that engagement? Do you have relationships with your um, pre-med committee members? How are they working on that site? Can they advise you as a committee packet? Do you have a letter from a chemistry professor that can talk to your experience in the lab? not just those, but also then additional things. So clinical exposure, research, all of that are gonna be helpful supplemental letters, but it's important too, to be mindful of meeting the requirements that schools have. So you may be able to submit 15 letters based on the organization that puts out your application, but each school might say they want a few different things. 
this and be mindful of the differences of what the requirements are and then work with your letter writers to help craft that letter together so that they know what you're looking for, what they can help highlight about your skill set so that you're getting nuanced letters from each person highlighting important components and not potentially just the same phrase reiterated and not really expanding on who you are as a person. But we do, as uh, Susan has mentioned repeatedly, review everything holistically. That is an important piece. So one of these is not going to make or break your application, but it's important that you are seeing those themes throughout and that we as the admissions committees do as well. Clark. Um, I would definitely agree with that. Both of these are hugely important, starting with the letters of recommendation. If you're a recent graduate, then you should definitely have at least one letter of recommendation from a professor. I've had um, certain people on faculty reviews actually reach back out to me and have me reach back out to the candidate and ask for one if they haven't, just if they are a recent student. This is really going to be really important for you because your professor can um, speak to how you are as an actual student, how you interact with your peers, how engaged you are, how determined, your passion for the subject, things of that nature. Um, so those are really great and just kind of give you more context to who you are. And that goes for the statement of purpose as well. At Clark, ours is very open-ended. You just can speak to why you're interested in Clark and why your background or why you think your background would be a good fit. And this is very important, especially for our international development school, because we even have students sometimes who say we're a math major, but they decide, hey, I want to go into international development. I'm passionate about it. I have some internship experience, work experience, but it's their statement of purpose that really shows us why they're interested. So I wouldn't gather that from just a transcript or a resume, but it's going to be the statement of purpose that kind of can show one, why you'd be a good candidate. And also sometimes um, this is really how you see why a student is really invaluable to a program. Faculty are really drawn to these and it's gonna show your writing style and um, just can give a lot more about who you are than just the transcript and resume. And WPI. Perfect. Um, again, we've been talking about this kind of frequently throughout the session. I guess what I'd like to say is when it comes to your statement of purpose, this is your time to talk to us. You know, when you're filling out the application, you know, we're asking, okay, submit your GPA, you know, fill in the, you know, fill in this information, fill in that information, a lot of forms, a lot of different questions. When it comes to your statement of purpose, this is you writing to us. This is your voice speaking to the admissions committee. Um, so it's really take that time, take some effort into it. We read thousands of applications, which means we read thousands of statements of purpose. Um, so I want to remember your statement of purpose. There are still, I've worked for multiple schools. There are still students. I remember their application from five, six years ago because it was such a good application or I remember their story. Um, you know, when you take that file to the admissions committee and, you, and you're presenting it, sometimes it's, oh, well, their statement of purpose, once again, they, you know, have, have this theory and everyone talks about that. When you want to bring an applicant to an admissions committee, you want to say, and look at their story. They've done this. Look how well they are. Um, again, that kind of goes in with your recommendations as well. You want people that are going to speak the best about you. Um, I've had applicants that picked really bad references. You know, I've read reference letters that they don't recommend that student to the school. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh my God, like, why would you pick this person? They're, they're not saying good things about you. Um, it, and it happens and maybe sometimes you just don't know. Um, but really think about who's recommending you. Think about what you're going to write. Um, and I guess the last thing I would like to, to point out, not every school has this, um, WPI does. I know some other schools actually on this call also have the question on their application. Um, is there anything, is there any discrepancies in your academics that you want to explain? Um, this can be a really, really important question. So if I'm reviewing your application and I see that your second semester freshman year was you, like D's, C minuses, and the rest of your academics are, are pretty good, I need to know why that that's a bad area. So, so you can, I mean, and not even necessarily details, but students say, I had a really rough semester, a rough start freshman year, but I improved going on. Okay, well now I know something was going on. Um, sometimes if we look at an application and you see some terrible grades, in my mind, I'm just gonna think, okay, well, they're just not, they couldn't hack that subject or they, you know, they couldn't perform during that class. Unless I have a reason for you as to maybe why you didn't perform well in that course. Um, so really just kind of um, take those things into consideration um, and really just think about how do you want, how do you want to present you to us? Um, 
this is just something to think about and kind of add on to some really great points my colleagues are saying. Thank you. Um, let's move on to financial aid. Um, what kind of federal and institutional funding is available to students in helping to financially support their graduate education? And here we are going to turn to Assumption, Tufts, and Worcester State. Assumption. Looks like Su uh, Assumption may have frozen out here. Um, how about Tufts? I'll start. <laughs> there we go. Um, first of all, the other group got the more fun question because it's a lot of fun to talk about letters of evaluation and essays and things that you still remember about people. And, and for some of us, it's the reason that we started this um, because it's really magical to really advocate for someone or really understand them through their application and meet them. Um, and Patrick was describing how sometimes that person isn't exactly how we picture them, but it's still it, it really, that, that's why we do what we do. We wanna build a community on our campus and we wanna be part of that community. Um, so talking about debt isn't quite as fun, but it is arguably maybe more important. Um, so for my program, for example, veterinary medicine, that's a field where the debt to income ratio is higher than most in the health professions. And so I've kind of had the same theme throughout of we want you to make a really informed decision that's something where when I am reading a personal statement or when I'm doing, if someone's personal statement is talking about, I want to be able to help animals and that's why I want to go to vet school. For me, I go, that's not a good enough answer because you can help animals in so many other ways and not take on the four years and the sometimes $250,000, $300,000 worth of debt. So making an informed decision is the first part. Tufts is a private school. So we're the only veterinary school in New England. So for those of you on this call, we may be very appealing to you. Um, we're a private school, but you're going to be out of staters everywhere. So, um, the other schools are going to be just as expensive, uh, unless you can change your state residency. There are a couple of schools where that's the situation. There is a small difference between a Massachusetts resident and an, uh, out of state resident of about $5,000 per year. But when you, when tuition is like $60,000 a year, it's not a huge difference. So our aid comes in the form of some institutional aid based on need, but that still only covers something like 8,000, 9,000 out of 65,000. The rest is gonna be federal aid. Um, that's going to be the um, basically loans that you're gonna to have to pay back once you are no longer part of our program. So once you've graduated, those are the loans that start accruing interest. Um, by B, I mentioned we're private, which doesn't make as much sense necessarily to everyone. So the reason I mentioned that is it means we have less state funding. So we don't really have scholarship money um, as far as merit aid. I wish we did. And that's why I kind of alluded to earlier, there are people that absolutely all things being equal would have chosen Tufts, but maybe a different school uh, was able to provide them with more money. So that is a factor. Um, over the last year, we actually have just um, been able to create four diversity scholarships. So those are specifically for students that are either underrepresented or, or underserved. We keep that very vague um, on purpose so it can characterize a variety of students. So that's a step in the right direction. But ultimately, if you're going to veterinary school or some of these other programs, it is a big financial decision. Um, and that's something we want you to, to have enough experience to make sure you are ready for that. And this is worth it to you. And if you could be equally satisfied doing something else, I encourage you to, to explore it. Mr. State. Thank you. This is a big, big topic. And I don't, you know, I don't think I can cover it in my, you know, allotted one minute. Um, what I will say is that there have, been, there have been firms who have done research and they've talked about the three different ways that students choose their programs, whether it be undergrad or graduate. So what's the driver? Is it academic prestige? Is it financial? Or is it what they call fit and feel? So I think as a prospective graduate student, you should really think about what is driving you. Is it you know, the most prestigious program you can find and get into? Is it the most financially 
uh, secure program? Is it a, a fit and feel of the program in the campus? Once you know what's really your number one driver, it will help you come up with your list of programs. And to Ford's point, the programs are all going to be a different cost. And that cost may not necessarily be what we call sticker price. So when you find these programs and you see how much they are, just know that some of these programs do have merit scholarships, institutional aid, diversity scholarships. There is federal financial aid that you can apply to and use. And all of that may make some of these programs more affordable than you think they are at the outset. So what the advice that I give my own children is it's finances is important, but you need to be aware that the sticker price, that price up front may not be what you're actually going to pay. So, so again, you think about what is driving you because if it's not finances, if, is it, I just want to get into the best school I can get into the most, the strongest reputation school, then what you're really saying is that the finances, you know, come second or third and that's okay. And that's going to help you build those lists. So again, this is a topic that, boy, I could talk about for a long time, and I, and I don't have that kind of time right now, but it is something to really think about. The next and last thing I'll say about it is that there's really only three ways to pay for school, and that is with past, present, or future dollars. That's it. Those are your choices. The past dollars, what have you saved, you or your family? Your present dollars, what's your current income potential? Can you work during the day and go to school at night? You know, if, if yes, great, that, that can be taken into consideration. If no, again, then that leaves you with future dollars. And those are the dollars that you borrow, right? So put those buckets together. What have you saved, if anything? What can you currently earn while you're in school? And what are you willing to borrow? And I personally suggest thinking about those things before you pick your programs. Um, I do think that, that those, those kinds of conversations with, with yourself, your, your spouse, your family, those things are important before you commit to what could be very expensive and yet excellent investment, right? These programs could be a $200,000 loan, but if it's setting you up to earn 250,000 a year, right? That's a good investment. So, so very complicated question, very complicated topic, but, um, but one that you should really spend some, some time. And the fact that you're here tonight with us tells me that you're already thinking about these things. So, so kudos to you. Thank you. Paul, I just want to give you a time check. We are at, um, we are approaching the six o'clock hour when we were going to go into breakout rooms. Okay. My suggestion would be that we wrap up the question number eight and then move right into the breakout rooms for um, more of a one-on-one -on -one personal Q&A answering. Very good. Okay, so our final question of, of this session, of this particular um, um, segment of the session um, is, what do you think are the most important factors a student should consider? Um, actually, you know what, I, I, I'm gonna jump that. I'm gonna go to our final question and allow all of our panelists to very briefly speak. Um, and that is, what is your best application advice to prospective students? Do we have assumption back? Yes, I'm so sorry. I'm having connectivity issues. Can you hear me? We we can hear you, Sue. So so the question is what is what, what, what is your best application <laughs> um, advice to prospective graduates, graduate students? Yeah, sure. Um really my my best advice is to really research your options. Um we again, we want a fit that's good for you. You should shop around. I mean, we would love you to attend Assumption, but you you should shop around um, different schools, attend as many events as you can, open houses. I know everything's virtual right now, so it can be tough. But ask questions. We're here to help you. Um, it's our job. We don't mind doing it. We want to, you know, be there to help and support. Um, so just all of that, you know, just make sure you're, you're you know, you're doing your research, you're meeting the deadlines, um, and you want to be meet those deadlines so you're very prepared. You know, you wanna be prepared to, um, you know, take those next steps by buying your books and just getting registered and everything. So just be cognizant of, um, of your timeline. Clark. Um, I would say, know what you're getting into, do your research, make sure there's faculty that you're interested in their experience, just figure out what 
is most important to you in your program and look into that. And also, um, as Amy was saying, make sure you're able to communicate your story to the review committee, whether that be through the requirements or reaching out to them directly to give them some context. Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Science. Um, make sure you reach out to admission offices. Um, there is, we're all here to help you. Um, and, uh, you know, we might seem scarier than we actually are, but, you know, we're, I, I like to think we're not scary, all of us here. But, um, you know, if you have a question about requirements, you know, applications, our, our review process, anything like that, just reach out and ask. Um, the worst we can say is no. And, you know, hopefully we'll provide some type of, you know, feedback on your, your transcript application, anything like that. So reach out, contact us. Tufts. Patrick stole mine. This feels like a fantasy draft where I was just one spot <laughs> too, too far. Um, so same thing for, for Tufts. I meet with about five people a day. There are plenty of students that come onto our program as students that I've never interacted with until they applied and that's fine. And it, it's a path to vet school for sure. Um, but we're also a situation where there are high school students I've met with that were choosing their colleges. There were first years that were worried, do I need to retake this class? There were second years that were saying, what should I do from an experience standpoint this summer? I have these two options. Someone else is about to apply. How can I stand out in my essays? So basically what it just means is it's a way for us to kind of know you ahead of time and, and hopefully for the right reasons if you're prepared for those conversations and also to just make sure there aren't surprises. So for the schools that offer those, take advantage of them. UMass Medical. Read the instructions carefully and fully before you dive into anything. There's a lot to do. So make sure you know what you're getting into and you don't assume that the paragraph above the open text field doesn't tell you something unique. It's like Ikea furniture. Worcester State. So I would just share with you that there's a big dirty secret in higher ed and that is there is no perfect school. <laughs> We're all really good options. <laughs> We're all accredited, which means we all have to answer to a higher power to make sure that we're doing all the things we're supposed to be doing. All the programs are good. And if you don't get into your first choice school, I promise you it's going to be okay. Shoot for the moon, shoot for the moon, but you will land somewhere good, I promise. WPI. And to kind of reiterate what everyone's saying, especially what Jen just said, pay attention to directions and pay attention to details. We all want to go through, go through things fast, I do it. We're all guilty of it. I'm not, I am really not putting shame on anyone. However, I have watched applicants lose their spot because they didn't fill out the application correctly. And, and honestly, when you look at movies, I feel like, I feel like we're kind of demonized in movies that we're sitting around with this big red stamp that is denying. We want to deny students and we're only taking the best. That is not the reality. It's actually quite the opposite. Um, and I think my colleagues kind of would, would join in here with me that we are fighting to get you admitted. We are more than likely going out and being your biggest cheerleader to convince an admission committee that you, that you do belong here. Um, granted, that is not the case in every single application, but more often than not, um, we, we are aiming for more accepts than denies. So um, please don't be scared to reach out to us, contact us. There are no dumb questions. Um, I would hate for someone to get misinformation just because they were scared to, to write an email or to pick up the phone to chat with us. And I'll take the final word here. And uh, that is uh, be engaged throughout the whole process and let schools know who you are. Um, we're a little bit of, of a big brother in the fact that uh, we as institutions, um, there is software now. We know how many visits you're making to campus. Uh, we know how many contacts you're making with our offices. Uh, we know how many emails you're opening and what links you're clicking on. Um, if you're truly interested in a particular school, uh, I would say make that interest loud and clear. Uh, and that's particularly true with faculty who are far more involved in the admissions decisions uh, than they are at the undergraduate level. Uh, and in the end, their judgment carries an awful lot of weight. Uh, and the more you get, they know you, the more benefit of the doubt they're apt to give you. And that can be especially true if you find yourself fighting for just a few precious spots among an, a group of e equal candidates. So again, just let them know who you are. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Janine right now. And I just want to thank all of our panelists for some uh, wonderful insight and um, uh, very much appreciate everyone participating.
Thanks, Paul, and thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today.